Hi, it's Courtney back again with uh, more Halloween horror movies. Uh, um, going through my collection. Um, I told you I have a huge collection, so uh, it's going to take me a while to get through it. And whatever I don't get through this year before Halloween, I will talk about next year. So there won't be as many next year uh, unless I get more more horror films, but, um, okay, the first one that I've got is, um, directed by Wes Craven, and, uh, it is My Soul to Take, um, there is a, a killer going around, calls himself the Ripper, and uh, he's um, he's a family man with a, you know, a wife and a daughter, and his wife's pregnant, and he has uh, split personalities, and one of them is what they call the Riverton Ripper, and uh, on the night that Abel Plankoff, who is the Riverton Ripper, is uh, murdered, seven children are born on that same night. Um, one is uh, uh, a boy named uh, Adam, but people call him Bug, and uh, one is Jerome, and he's born blind. Then uh, there's also uh, his, his friend uh, Dunkelman. Um, a religious girl named Penelope, and, uh, forgetting the other two, two names, uh, of the, uh, the kids, uh, but there's, a uh, also, uh, a bully girl, she's not part of the, the seven kids that were born, her name is, uh, Fang, uh, her real name's Leah, but everybody calls her Fang, and, uh, but on the night the Riverton River died, seven kids were born. And so each year they have this kind of like ceremony at the bank of the river where he's supposed to have been, you know, killed. Some people think that he still survived. Um, the kids do like a ritual to keep the river from coming out of the river. And uh, when it's Bug's turn to do it... Um, he, he fails, and, uh, after, afterwards, uh, the, uh, the seven kids start getting killed off one by one, and, uh, each time they die, it's as if their souls go into Bug, and he starts taking on their, their personalities. Kind of like Alice, Alice did in the, uh, Dream Master, the fourth Nightmare on Elm Street kind of movie, but, uh, so, of course, I like anything by, uh, by Wes Craven. So, um, some people, I've heard, they don't really, you know, they don't really like it, but I do. I think it's, it's a good movie, and the, the concept of, you know, these souls, uh, you know, being part of, you know, they're supposed to be the seven personalities of, the, the Riverton River, and, uh, it's just, it's kind of a, a neat concept, and, uh, there's kind of some twists in there, not really big twists, but kind of like, just like, out of the moment, wham kind of moments that you don't expect, but, uh, it's, it's a pretty good movie, I like it, they play it on sci-fi a lot, so I decided to buy it for myself. So that I can watch watch it, and uh, I like it. But I like I like anything Wes Craven, so it's a pretty good film. Uh, um, another film that is one of my favorites. It's directed by Peter Jackson, and it is The Frighteners with uh, Michael Michael J. Fox. I had to turn my big light on today because it's so dark and cloudy outside. But um, great. Frank Bannister, played by Michael J. 
Fox um, goes around town uh, claiming that he is like, you know, kind of like a an exorcist ghost busting type of person who will rid people's houses of ghosts. And uh, the thing is, Frank can uh, see ghosts and talk to them after having a traumatic experience of uh, being in a car crash where his wife died so he can talk to ghosts and he uses a few few ghosts to uh, go around town and you know haunt places and then he'll go and you know get rid of them and get paid so so he's a con artist but he's played by Michael J. Fox so you you you're gonna love him because he's Michael J. Fox so um but he uh he goes one night to the home of Lucy, played by Trini Alvarado, and her husband. And uh, he sees a number on her husband's forehead. And then uh, the next day, he's out jogging and he just drops down dead. So, um, you know, Frank tries to, uh, you know you know, talk to his, his widow and everything, but he, uh, he says kind of different things because, uh, the guy's kind of an, an asshole, but, um, and Lucy has her own plot where she's going to, uh, you know, take care of this, uh, woman named Patty, played by Dee Wallace, and, uh, a long time ago, she was, uh, a girlfriend of a guy named Johnny Bartlett, played by Jake Busey, who killed a bunch of people. And, uh, so she's, she's kind of traumatized from it, and she lives, you know, shut in from the world with her mom. And, uh, so, uh, eventually the paths of all, you know, all these characters cross when, uh, Frank starts seeing a figure like the Grim Reaper going around town and killing people. And every time he kills a person, a number appears on their, their forehead. Like a, a total, a tally. And, uh, there's uh, an agent played by Jeffrey Combs that is trying to, you know, go, you know, go through all this, uh, this evidence and, uh, trying to pin it on, on Bannister, and, uh, it's, it's a really interesting movie, it's got that black comedy kind of feel that Peter Jackson was known for in his, his early days, before he went on doing, you know, Lord of the Rings and stuff like that, so, um, so, of course, Michael J. Fox is, is really good in this movie, and, uh, Jeffrey Combs always steals the show of whatever movie he's in, and, uh, it's, uh, also got, uh, John Aston, the original Gomez Adams from, uh, the original Adams family as a ghost, and I think... I, I read somewhere that some of the outtakes when they were doing it, Michael J. Fox would call the character who is known as the judge Doc, because I guess he kind of reminded him of Christopher, you know, Christopher Lloyd when they were doing Back to the Future movies. So that's kind of, it's kind of, you know, cute to know that fact. But, uh, so, and it has music by Danny Elfman, which it has kind of sort of Beetlejuice-like cues to it, but, uh, you know, and I, I love this movie, you'll end up laughing, and, uh, you know, it has, you know, serious tones, you know, dealing with, you know, near-death experiences, and, you know, um, where people go after they die, um, you know, especially, you know, what's it like for good people to go to heaven, what's it like for evil people to go to hell, and I, I just, I love this movie. I've, I've loved it for a long time, like, ever since I saw it, so I had to get it on DVD, 
because uh, my mom recorded it off TV, like off Stars or Encore, a long time ago, and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, The Frighteners is a pretty good movie. Um, these next, these next few things are a bunch of uh, collections that I have of movies. Some of them I have not watched yet, um, just because I just I haven't gotten around to watching them. But some of them I have. So, um, of course, I have this Wes Craven horror collection, and it has three movies in it. It has The Serpent and the Rainbow, Shocker, and The People Under the Stairs. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen uh, any of these, but um, The People Under the Stairs is about a young boy, and they call him Fool. And uh, his family, um, they live underneath these landlords, this, this crazy, you know, married couple. And uh, people just kind of know them as, you know, Ma and Pa. But they're, they're awful people, and they're the uh, landlords of where his family lives. in kind of like these, these tenement kind of apartment places. So um, his sister's boyfriend, played by Ving Rhames, hears that uh, the landlord people have a lot of money. And uh, so they decide to break into the house to, uh, you know, steal all this stuff. And uh, when he's, he's in the house, he meets a girl named Alice, played by A.J. Langer from My So-Called Life. And, uh, well, she's supposed to be 12, but I think she's like 16, the actress was. But uh, he discovers that um, they... They mistreat this girl, and uh, um, they're into a lot of weird, weird things. And uh, so, like, the, the dad dresses up in, like, this bondage outfit, and they have a Rottweiler that they stick on people, and um, they, come, they come home, and, you know, they find, uh, they find Fool in the house, and... Uh, there are, of course, these people under the stairs of the basement of their, their home, and uh, it's it's just a really weird, creepy kind of movie, and uh, one spoiler that I'll give is the, the mother and father are actually brother and sister, so it's got this weird, creepy kind of vibe, and it's got this, you know, early 90s horror kind of feel. And, uh, it, it goes to a lot of, like, dark kind of places. There's a, a young, a young boy. I'm not really sure how old, uh, the actor was, but his name is Roach, and he lives in the walls of the house, and, uh, they, they cut out his tongue. So the actor has to go around acting, you know, like, he has no tongue, so he can't talk. And, uh, it's just, it's a really creepy kind of movie, uh, you feel a little, a little kind of, you know, grungy after watching it, but, um, and the, the actor who plays the, the little boy named Fool, he's really good. Uh, he was in, a uh, Moonwalker. He played, like, a, a little mini Michael Jackson, uh, in that movie, so he's, he's really good, uh. Um, it's been a while again, since I've seen some of these movies, but, um, so I was just seeing if there was anything extra on the back that I could kind of read from. I know I'm kind of cheating reading off the back, but like I said, I haven't seen some of these in a while. Um, Shocker. Shocker is about a killer put on, a uh, death row after he, um, uh, a young, a young man, um, picks him out of a lineup and stuff, and a young man whose father is uh, a policeman, they go to watch the ex execution of this murderer, and uh, something happens where some sort of, like, uh, I don't know, electrical 
kind of demon thing makes a deal with him. And uh, so he his body is dead, but his spirit's alive, and he can go into uh, the TV and uh, electrical things, and he can take over people's bodies. And so he's going to go after this, this kid uh, who helped, you know, put him away in a jail and send him to death row. And uh, it's kind of... It's kind of cheesy, a little bit, so, um, but it's still good, um, there's a lot of interaction between the young man and his girlfriend, and, uh, there's a scene that happens later in the movie that it's just, you'll see it, and, uh, it might make you a little sick, but, uh, it's, it's a pretty good movie. Out of the three movies in this, it's probably not... It's probably the third one out of the three that I enjoy, but, uh, so, Shocker's an okay movie. It's one of, uh, Wes Craven's kind of more, you know, underrated films, but, uh, and it was kind of towards, like, uh, the end of the 80s, so, uh, and, uh, you know, People Under the Stairs was, like, early 90s, so, um, the last one, kind of in the mid-80s, is uh, The Serpent and the Rainbow. An anthropologist, played by Bill Pullman, he goes to um, Haiti um, to try and find the uh, kind of uh, drugs and the type of things that uh, people in that culture use to make zombies. There's like a a powder that, you know, you can use to turn people into, uh, zombies. And, you know, they're just, they're mindless slaves and you tell them what to do and they'll do it. And, you know, it's part of the, the Haitian culture. And, uh, so he gets pulled kind of down this, you know, you know, dark world of, you know, Haitian voodoo. And, uh, it's got, uh, powerful, jarring kind of scenes, and, uh, it's very, you know, kind of violent, but, um, it's supposed to be based on a real book by a real anthropologist who went down to, uh, you know, study this, and, uh, it's, you know, rumored that he, you know, got turned into a zombie, but eventually, you know, it wore off or something, and he wrote about it his experiences. I don't think it's completely 100% accurate, but it kind of, you know, adds that suspense to the movie. And, uh, so, um, so out of this collection, I'd probably go People Under the Stairs, The Serpent and the Rainbow, and then Shocker. But, and of course, like I said, I like movies by Wes Craven. If I can find something by Wes Craven that I want, I will get it. And when you put three of his movies in one package, I'll get it. So, uh, the next one I have is a four-film package. And it is from John Carpenter. So, um, I got it at Best Buy for $14.99. Four movies for $14.99. That's, that's something that you can't pass up. And, of course, it has, uh... It has The Thing, They Live, Prince of Darkness, and Village of the Dam, which is a remake. Um, so, of course, uh, so people will probably kind of boo and hiss at me, but um, I've seen it in bits and pieces. Well, two of them I've seen in bits and pieces when people talk about it, but I've never actually sat and uh, watched two of these movies, and the two that I haven't really watched fully are The Thing and Prince of Darkness. So, again, I'm, I mostly bought this because I, for the longest time, I tried to find his uh, remake of Village of the Damned on DVD, and when I saw this package, I was so ecstatic because I finally found it. And of course, I love, I love John Carpenter, not just his horror, but I love, you know, other things that he's done. You know, um, Big Trouble in, in Little China, and, you know, of course, Halloween, but, you know, 
he's he's done other things besides that, but of course. So uh, just like with Wes Craven, if I see anything with John Carter, I'm gonna get it. But um, uh, the thing, of course, everybody knows about that. Um, it wasn't like a big hit when it first came out to theaters, but it kind of gained popularity when it went out onto video, and it has you know a big cult following. Um, you know, a research team, they're stuck in, you know, the Antarctic, and they find this, this thing buried in the snow, and they don't really know what it is, but it's an alien life form that can take over, you know, a person, and uh, everything that it, you know, takes over, it can, you know, duplicate that, that person or thing, and, uh, so they're, you know, they're trying to battle it, and, uh, you know, it has Kurt Russell and, and Keith David in it, so, um, so everybody knows about that and the effects by, by Rob Motin, and, um, you know, a lot of people say that it's, you know, it's very, like, visceral, and, uh, I'm just not sure yet if I can go, go through, through the movie and not be, you know, scared about it, because, you know, I've seen, like I said, I've seen it in bits and pieces, and then I've seen people talk about it, and there's some scenes in it that I just, like, I'm sitting there watching, and it kind of makes me want to squirm, and, um, you know, it's fun to be scared, but it's another thing to be, like, kind of creeped out of, where, you know, like, you're, you become paranoid uh, about everything, and I'm afraid that's what this is going to do to me if I watch it, and, um, so, um, and then, uh, Prince of Darkness, um, it's part of, you know, a trilogy that, uh, John Carpenter created where, you know, the thing, Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness are kind of like this, uh, you know, supposed to be like this trilogy of, you know, like, the apocalypse, you know, everything. So, um, in the Prince of Darkness, a bunch of graduate students and uh, a scientist and a priest find this container of green goo <clears throat> and I think it's um, um, it's actually supposed to be Satan this, this green goo and he like takes over people and kind of turns them into zombies and you know you can get infected and everything so it's it's also another one of those movies where, you know, I've seen it in bits and pieces of people talking about it, and I get the same feeling from it like I do from The Thing, and it's like, yeah, I really, I really want to watch it. It's like, so, but, uh, the two movies on here that I have seen all the way through are They Live and Village of the Damned. Um, of course, They Live has, uh, Rowdy, Rowdy Piper, who plays a man called Nada, and, uh, he, um, gets this job, you know, working, uh, working with a, a bunch of other people, and, you know, he's kind of like a drifter. One of his co-workers is, uh, Keith David again. So, um, he finds this, um, box of sunglasses one day, and when he puts them on, he sees, like, all these billboards of, like, subliminal messages, like, you know, like, the word, like, obey, and, you know, sleep, and stuff like that, so it's just, and, you know, he sees everything in black and white when he puts them on, and, uh, when he looks at some people, he sees these really terrifying, creepy alien faces, and, uh, like, they have, like, they have, like, no skin, and they have, you know, like, like, these skull faces, and, like, the nose is gone, where, like, all the cartilage is gone from the nose, and just, like, these creepy skull faces with these big, like, shiny kind of eyes, and, uh, it's really creepy, so he, he learns that, you know, these aliens are trying to, like, you know, take over our society with these subliminal messages, and trying to pass for real people, and I guess they're also, like, broadcasting stuff on, on TV, too, you know, trying to get in, into our heads, 
So he goes to this re reporter played by Meg Foster and tries to, you know, get her help to, you know, stop, you know, them broadcasting all this stuff. And uh, he uh, convinces his, his co-worker, Keith David, to help him. And they get in this really long fight. And, uh, you know, it's actually Rowdy Roddy Piper and Keith David fighting. It, like, it goes on for, like, I think... 13 minutes or so. It's, it's really long, though. But, you know, they just beat the crap out of each other. Because, you know, Rowdy Roddy Parker is just like, I just want you to put on these glasses and see what I'm seeing. And Keith Dibb's like, man, you're crazy. And they just get in a fight. But, um, so, and, so it's got that, uh, John Carpenter kind of humor that's kind of like in big trouble in Little China. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I think everybody likes kind of like the camp status of, you know, a wrestler being in the main main role. And uh, I think, you know, Roddy Piper did a good job in here. And, of course, everybody knows his line. I have come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and I'm all out of bubblegum. It's it's campy, and you like it. It's it's a cult classic. It's a pretty good movie, and uh, it, it's a good one. Um, so, and then of course, Village of the Damned is a remake of a movie from the 60s that was actually more of like a British film. So, um, in the town of Midwich, or maybe it's not called, I think it is still called Midwich in here, but it's set in, you know, California instead of England, but, uh. The town has um, a principal school played by Linda. Oh my God, I can't, I can't ever pronounce her name, but she's from the Crocodile Dundee movies. But um, a principal there, and there's a young girl played by Meredith Salinger, and um, there's a priest played by Mark Hamill, and uh, a doctor played by Christopher Reeve. Um, this is the last movie he did before his accident. So, um, but there are all these, these people in town, and, uh, one day, um, Christopher Reeve's character is out of town, and, uh, the, Lin Linda's character's husband goes out of town to get stuff, but, um, while they're gone, uh, some, a weird occurrence happens in the town where everybody passes out. Everybody. The people, the animals. And, uh, it's only confined to the, the limits of the town. Because when, uh, when Linda's character's husband comes back, he's driving his truck, and as soon as he passes the town line, he passes out, and he, he crashes his truck, and he gets killed. And they send, like, government people in, and, uh, in, like, hazmat suits, and as soon as they, they cross the town line, they pass out, and if they pull them back over they wake up but um so people pass out and then uh when you know all the people in town wake up um the women in town um i think it's i think it's 12 of them find out that they are pregnant and uh one woman who was having trouble having children um finds out she's pregnant but her husband was away on a business trip, and the Meredith Salinger character is supposed to be a virgin, and she's pregnant. And then, of course, Linda's pregnant, and then Christopher Reeve's wife is pregnant. So, um, with all the women being pregnant, a uh, government agent played by Kirstie Alley comes in and, you know, is uh, going to be there when all the women give birth, and, uh, so all the babies are born, and uh, Meredith Salinger's baby dies, and Kirstie Alley takes it away. So um, years go by, and the kids, they grow up, and they all have the same white platinum hair and emotionless faces, and they're, they're highly intelligent, but it's like they have, you know, no souls. And anybody who... Um, does harm to the 
children, bad, bad and terrible things end up happening to them. And, uh, of course, you know, they, uh, they find out the the children are, you know, not human. They're, uh, different life forms. They're aliens, and, uh, it's, you know, just one of those, like, kind of, you know, paranoid mob mentality kind of movies where they're gonna go after the children, but Christopher Reeves, Christopher Reeves thinks that he can, you know, teach the children humanity, and the, the youngest one, David, who's, uh, Linda, I'm not even trying to say her name because I always butcher it, but, um, he's the youngest one, and he kind of develops a little bit more humanity than the others, and Christopher Reeve's daughter is, of course, like, the ringleader of the kids, so, um, but, um, it's a good remake. I've seen, I've seen the original, and, uh, I like the remake, of course, it's more modern and more now, but, you know, it still has that, you know, that paranoia kind of feeling to the film, and, uh, you know, um, because of this incident that happens in the town, you know, a lot of, you know, people's lives are, you know, changed and ruined, and it's... It's still a good a good movie. There are parts in it that like legitimately creep me out, but I can still watch it. And uh, of course, Christopher Reeve is an amazing actor. Was an amazing actor, and you know I like him in this movie because you know his daughter's the head of all the the children, and uh, so he kind of puts the responsibility on himself to try and you know teach these children how, how to actually be human and, you know, have a conscience and, you know, you know, no right from wrong. And, uh, Kirstie Alley, a lot of people mostly know her for being, like, in the Look Who's Talking movies and, you know, being kind of comedic, but it gives a chance for her more serious dramatic side to come out. And, you know, I've, I've seen her in, you know, drama roles, and she's, she's really an amazing actress, so everybody thinks she's more like a, a com, a comedy actress, but she's really good at doing drama, and to see her in a horror film is kind of, it's kind of nice, actually, so, um, so I guess, because I haven't watched the thing, or Prince of Darkness, I can't really rate it, but, uh, so, They Live and Village of the Damned are both good. I like Village of the Damn more because I, I, I saw it first before I saw any of these other ones. So, uh, I go with, uh, you know, they live in Village of the Damned, and of course, you know, I guess eventually when I watch the thing in Prince of Darkness, I'll be able to give a better view about it. So, it's going to be another one of those long videos. Uh, um, I have a double feature, two disc of movies. And it's uh, Underworld and Underworld Evolution. Um, of course, Kate Beckinsale plays Celine. She's a death dealer. She's a vampire who hunts lichens, which are werewolves. And the lichens and the death dealers have been at war with each other for a very long time, for centuries. And uh, the lichens are after... Michael Corvinus, played by Scott Speedman, who is the, you know, right now living descendant of the Corvinus family, which is where both the, the werewolves and the vampires come from. Because there was uh, one son, William, and there was one son, Marcus. William's the werewolf, Marcus is the vampire, and uh, they had, a, you know, a human father, kind of gifted with like immortality and stuff because he has he has the genes that created you know a vampire and a werewolf but he's human but uh they're trying to uh find michael and use his blood to you know create a uh, more powerful werewolves and um the leader of the lichens 
Lucian, played by Michael Sheen, um, is thought to have been dead, but he's alive, so they're uh, trying to find Michael to use his blood to strengthen them, and uh, the vampires right now are being led by Craven, who um, wants Celine for himself, and kind of becomes a little a little jealous too when uh, Celine and Michael fall in love. And so it's basically kind of like Romeo and Juliet with vampires and werewolves and a whole lot of guns and violence. Oh. And um, so uh, because of, cause Celine finds out that Craven and Lucian are working together when Craven was supposed to kill Lucian, she wakes up one of the elders, Victor, played by Bill Nighy, and uh, tries to uh, show him all the treachery that Craven's done. And then, of course, you know they still want Michael. So, uh, so yeah, it's basically Romeo and Juliet with werewolves and vampires and lots of guns and violence. And uh, so, uh, when it goes to Underworld Evolution, the first sequel. Um, Marcus wakes up and tries to go after Celine and Michael to keep them from finding his brother William, but they end up finding his his father. And uh, not gonna lie, every time I try to watch Underworld Evolution, I end up falling asleep before the movie's over. I don't know why that is. I can sit through Underworld and watch it ten thousand times, and the story pulls me in, but when I watch Underworld Evolution, I always end up falling asleep and missing the last half of it. But, you know, I know what happens because you can just get on Wikipedia and read what happens. Or, or watch somebody review it and know what happens. So, I'm not saying Underworld Evolution is bad, it's just for some reason it doesn't grab my attention as much as the first one does. And, uh, of course... I love Kate Beckinsale. She's a badass in these movies. Oh. And, uh, so, but, uh, so, uh, Underworld's great. Underworld Evolution kind of under underwhelms me, I guess. And, um, I have, I have seen the, uh, the others, uh, Rise of the Lycans, Underworld Awakening, and, uh, under, Underworld Blood Wars. I'll get to those when uh, I get to the DVDs. Like I said, I just reach in there and grab out a handful of stuff, and that's what I talk about. So, um, but out of these two, Underworld, then Underworld Evolution. So, and I just, I like this leaf. It's so shiny, and I like this icy blue color to it. And it makes uh, Kate Beckinsale's vampire eyes just pop. I like that. Speaking of vampires, I haven't watched a lot of these on this collection, but um, I mostly I mostly bought it for one movie, kind of like my other collections. I'd buy them for like one film, and uh, you know they're always it's always a good price if you can get like three or four or five or more movies for a decent price. So um, I can't remember how much I paid for this, but it has. It has six movies on it, and uh, like I said, I bought it for one movie, and it's kind of not uh, what you think it is, but it is um, from Universal, and it's the Dracula Complete Legacy Collection. So, all six films from 1931 to 1948. So, everybody knows about Dracula. I had to read it in high school in English class. Oh. So, Count Dracula comes from Transylvania to England. You know, Jonathan Harker, Mina, kills her friend Lucy, she turns into a vampire, turns Mina into one, Dr. Van Helsing. Everybody knows Dracula. So, because you've either seen it, or you had to read the book, like I did. Oh. So, so, of course it has the, uh, you know, 1931 Dracula with Bela Lugosi, and of course Dracula is always a classic movie, and uh, so I like Dracula. Um, 
it also this also has a bonus fe feature of having the 1931 Spanish version of Dracula, which a bunch of people I've read they think it's better than the Bela Lugosi version. So um, it's also got uh, Dracula's daughter from 1936, son of Dracula from 1943, House of Frankenstein from 1944, House of Dracula 1945, and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein 1948. So you may think I bought this for Dracula. No, I didn't buy it for Dracula. Did I buy it for the Spanish version? Uh, no. I bought it because of the movie Dracula's Daughter. I saw it a long time ago on Turner Classic Movies, and I love Dracula's Daughter. It is a good classic universal movie, and um, in it, Gloria Holden plays Dracula's Daughter, Maria Zaleska. And she's one of those vampires that does not want to be a vampire. She, you know, she craves human things, you know, you know, to be treated like a human and be around humans and, you know, not be cursed to be a vampire. Um, so she ends up, you know, going to London and, uh, of course she can't, you know, fight her nature. She's still a vampire, so she still needs, you know, to feed on blood and stuff to live. And, uh, she, uh, falls in love with this, this doctor. And, uh, she kind of wants him to try and cure her vampirism. Try to make her human, because he's been doing some sort of experiments. Um, you know, that can, you know, alter, like, DNA and stuff like that early 30s version, and he happens to be friends with Dr. Van Helsing from the original Dracula, and, uh, but, uh, it, it has that great atmosphere, and, of course, you know, it's about, you know, a tortured vampire. She doesn't have a soul, but she doesn't want to be a monster, and, uh, a lot of people credit this as being, like, the first movie where there was, like, a lesbian vampire. She goes after men, but she also preys on women. And, uh, well, Gloria Holden is a beautiful woman. And you can see how she, you know, kind of has, like, that mesmerizing face. And, you know, you know, men, men want her and women are intrigued by her. And, uh, I just, I like, I like Dracula's daughter. I, I like classic horror movies from the 1930s and 40s where you don't have to have like a lot of where you know it's not blood you know something horrible is going to happen but you don't see it so your mind is like imagining what happened so it has you think a little bit more and of course you know you sympathize with you know Countess Zaleska's character because you know she's tortured and you know, she doesn't want to be this monster, but, you know, she can't go against her nature. She is a vampire. She's Dracula's daughter. So she, she cannot fight who she is. And, uh, but she, uh, you know, she'll do what she has to do to survive. But it's, it's a really good movie, you know, tone and atmosphere and so, so, um, I haven't seen anything else on this, so I've only seen two, two out of six of these movies, but, um, so, like I said, I got it for Dracula's Daughter. I've seen collections of these where they have, like, the, uh, Frankenstein and the Wolfman and, you know, all the classic Universal movie monsters, you know, in, uh, sets like these, but, uh, so if you're a vampire fan, this is uh, a good collection to have. Like I said, I don't remember how much I paid for it, but it's six movies in one, so can't pass up a deal like that. So, again, I appreciate people who watch this video and listen to me babble. Um, I will be back next time with some more 
uh, horror movie picks that you can watch for Halloween. And like I said, I'll be doing up it up to the day before Halloween. So until I see you next time, have a nice day.